The Web 3.0 in crypto space holds endless opportunities to make life-changing money. After all, you have open access to a brand new permissionless financial ecosystem, but this can definitely come with its share of risks. In fact, crypto can be like the Wild West, mostly because of hackers. And this year alone, we've seen hackers show over $1.4 billion from various exploits like the Axie Infinity $650 million attack, the Solana wormhole attack for $325 million, and the latest Nomad Bridge exploit for over $200 million. Now, there is a common thread between all these different attacks. And in this video, I want to break down the latest attack where the Nomad Bridge was drained for over $200 million and the shocking truth about this incident so that you can keep yourself safe. Because the last thing that you want to do in the crypto space is, you know, lose your ticket to the show as the rocket's about to leave the launch pad. So I'm going to talk all about that in this video today as a blockchain developer who works this technology on a daily basis. So if you're around here, hey, I'm Gregory. And on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step-by-step start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's get into this. Let's talk about the latest hack in the crypto space where nearly $200 million was taken from the Nomad Bridge, okay? So let's talk about the common theme between this particular attack and the other ones we've seen, like the Solana Wormhole and also the Axie Infinity Ronin Bridge. These all use technologies called bridges. So what are they? Well, bridges are essentially protocols that let blockchains talk to one another. So why would you use a bridge in the first place? So let's just pull up a diagram on my screen here so you can see how they work and talk about, you know, why you want to use it. So let's say that you wanted to, you know, move some money from one blockchain to another. Uh, let's say for the example of, you know, playing Axie Infinity, like this happened in the Ronin Bridge attack, and you had some funds on one blockchain, but you needed to move to a different blockchain to actually do this. Well, you know, you could go to a cryptocurrency exchange, potentially, all right, and then, you know, deposit money on there and then withdraw it onto a new exchange with whatever cryptocurrency that you needed, all right? But this is a central point of failure, right? You have to actually deposit on somebody else's basically website and then, you know, withdraw on the other side. And many users in the crypto space are wanting to move more towards uh, activity that's completely on chain where you don't have to use exchanges. And that's kind of where, that's where bridges come into play. So essentially, let's say that you wanted to move to that different blockchain and you're on Ethereum, for example. So if you had Ether, you could just you know, be here on blockchain A and then use a bridge to get over to blockchain B in order to perform whatever task that is. Other use cases might be like, let's say that you own Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, okay? And you wanted to use Bitcoin and DeFi, well, you could use something like Wrap Bitcoin, okay? Which is a smart contract version, an ERC-20 token version of Bitcoin. And you could, you know, essentially use a, a bridge to move from the Bitcoin blockchain to mint wrapped Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain in order to use it in DeFi, earn yield, you know, whatever. So those are a few reasons why you use a bridge and a high level of how they work. But let's get a little bit deeper of a view on how they work. And that's where we can actually see where the vulnerability comes into play. That's the common thread uh, between some of these other attacks. So it basically starts off like this. A user is on blockchain A. There's many different blockchains that support bridges, okay? And they want to move to blockchain B. So how do they do that? Well, essentially, they go to a website like this, all right? They connect with their MetaMask wallet, and they say, okay, I've got this much money in my account. Uh, I'm, on this, I'm on this blockchain, and I want to go to this blockchain. And you, do, you essentially just click a button and sign a transaction, and it moves money out of your wallet from one blockchain to another, all right? And I'll talk to the blockchain on-chain behind the scenes from this website. You know, but from an architecture standpoint, here's here's how it gets vulnerable. So essentially, uh, behind the scenes on the actual blockchain itself, of course, the users connect their wallet to that website, which talks to this blockchain. But how do the actual blockchains talk to one another? Okay, how does the bridge work? Because that's where the real problem is. When you have two different blockchains that run completely different uh, implementations, they don't natively talk to one another, all right? The Bitcoin blockchain has no way to talk to the Ethereum blockchain. They're their own, you know, unique ecosystems. So how do you create... Uh, something that, that does that. Well, the bridge is usually consists of uh, yeah, two or three different parts, right? All bridges work slightly differently, but typically the most common bridges are ones that uh, support blockchains that each support smart contracts. So let's say you're bridging from uh, you know, Ethereum to Avalanche or something like that. These are both EVM compatible chains that support smart contracts. Well, you have a smart contract on each blockchain, okay? And then most bridges, all right, have some sort of process in the middle that facilitates the transfer between each chain. So essentially, whenever you are moving funds from one blockchain to another, you're typically sending it to a smart contract on this blockchain, okay? And then there's a smart contract on the other side that also holds money, all right, that either mints uh, new money out of thin air and then understands how much 
money is in each smart contract on each side and essentially just captures funds on one side and then spits funds out on the other. And these contracts usually have money sitting inside of them and they usually have this process uh, in the middle that makes both of these smart contracts from each chain talk to one another. And this is separate of the blockchain. Usually it's off chain. This is on chain. This is off chain. So that's where the big vulnerabilities come into play. These smart contracts that are holding money, all right, are typically big honeypots for hackers. You know, this is where a lot of the money can, can get stolen from. And then these uh, processes right here that talk to one, make the blockchains talk to one another are also vulnerable to attack. So let's see how that's played out in some of these past hacks, respectively. So let's start off by looking at the wormhole bridge uh, for Solana. Okay, this was hacked for over $325 million. So let's take a look here. So you can say to carry out the attack, the attacker managed to forge a valid signature for a transaction that allowed them to freely mint 120,000 ETH. So that's wrapped Ether. Uh, equivalent on the Solana blockchain, which was, you know, going to be $325 million at the time of the theft without first inputting the equivalent amount. Okay, so let's look at how that happened. So essentially, uh, like I was saying before, uh, most bridges have some sort of process in the middle, all right, that lets the different blo uh, the different blockchains talk to one another and each of those communicates to uh, a smart contract on there, okay? So uh, in many cases, these bridges have to have some sort of digital signature, okay? At, at the heart of how uh, blockchains work in the first place are digital signatures. So it, let's just say that you are gonna go trade a token on Uniswap, like a decentralized exchange, for example. You know, you click swap and you sign a message from your wallet with your private key that authorizes that that is you, okay? And then, that, and then the blockchain will actually process that transaction as you because you signed it with your uh, wallet and it knows that you did that, okay? So many bridges uh, have some sort of digital signature process as well, where, you know, a, a transaction has to be authorized on one blockchain and actually signed, and the bridge uh, process actually interprets that and then authorizes that transaction on the other side. So here there's a critical vulnerability that essentially let the attacker spoof the signature, okay, so actually uh, fake a signature to authorize uh, minting, all right, uh, new tokens from scratch on a separate blockchain, okay? So essentially, uh, you know, there was money over here, okay? Uh, and then there was the ability to create money out of thin air over here, and the attacker faked the message that said, hey, I've, I've put money over here, and I want you to create new money that represents the actual money that's locked over here. And so they didn't have to put any money here. They just faked a signature, and then this was printed a whole bunch of money out of thin air that then they could go use on blockchain B and then, you know, trade it for whatever. And so the major vulnerability here is actually this process in the middle. Now, let's talk about uh, the actual smart contracts themselves because they can be incredibly vulnerable to attacks without even having to touch this, uh, you know, middle piece here or even do any kind of really sophisticated attack like it would take to spoof messages uh, between some sort of process in the middle. Because again, these smart contracts themselves hold lots of money and they're massive honeypots for hackers because if they can figure out how to exploit the contracts themselves, they can just walk away with huge amounts of money. And that's exactly what happened in the latest attack on the Nomad Bridge. Okay, so let's break down what happened in the Nomad Bridge. So inside of uh, one of these smart contracts, like I was showing you a second ago, that actually held all the funds, there was a critical uh, security vulnerability. So I'm going to pull up this tweet thread from Samsung here, which is who's one of the best uh, you know, security auditors in the space. Okay. So essentially, uh, one of these uh, smart contracts has a function that lets them process the message that gets sent in between each blockchain. Okay. So essentially, you, you make a function call in order to disperse funds uh, on the other side once it's been, you know, formally signed by the relayer. Okay. And so what happened was uh, these smart contracts actually got upgraded by the team recently before this attack and some people say like hey i thought smart contract code wasn't able to change well you can actually upgrade smart contracts with certain uh patterns okay but during this upgrade process they failed to actually set some valid values in the contract that pretty much let anybody you know take cryptocurrency out of this smart contract where they passed in certain values so essentially uh there was this function that lets them prove the messages like i was talking about and there was uh, a way where you could just pass in a zero value uh, for the acceptable route that would that authorize this transaction. Most of these values are going to be zero during initialization, okay, by default as common practice. But unfortunately, it had a side effect of auto-approving every single message. So pretty much anybody with access to this smart contract uh, who, you know, passed in values 
uh, like this with a zero value could prove the validity of the transaction and then as a side effect could just essentially withdraw money from this smart contract just by calling a function on this smart contract and, and essentially sort of like knowing the magic words for this function call. You didn't have to do any sophisticated like coding. You could just go in here and put in certain parameters and you could just start withdrawing money to the address. So this had a side effect of not only the hacker making off a lot of money, but other people realizing how this took place and they were just going around like 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 lots of different people were just taking money out of this contract after this vulnerability was exposed. And in this particular case, uh, it was the actual smart contracts themselves and their bridge implementation that were incredibly vulnerable. All right, so that's an overview of how some of the most recent bridge attacks have taken place. Again, this is the implementation for how many bridges work and they have many failure points, notably the smart contracts here and then also the process that lets the two blockchains talk together. Uh, and those are two examples of how each of those things have been exploited most recently. So what is the shocking truth behind this latest hack and others that are very similar to that? Well, at this point, like we can't assume that bridges are safe to use. OK, now that there's implications on that, which I'll talk about in a second. But, you know, we're seeing many different things in the crypto space get a bad rap. We're thinking things like algorithmic stable coins, like with the Terra Luna disaster that happened earlier this year. OK, we've seen lots of other algorithmic stable coins absolutely blow up. And, you know, it's sort of like we see lots of bridges also get exploited because of this implementation path and how they are extremely brittle. So that's the harsh truth. But there's an additional harsh truth to this, which is, you know, many different protocols in the crypto space are dependent upon bridges to really start taking off. OK, so, you know, I'm a huge proponent of Ethereum layer two scaling solutions for the future of blockchain scalability in the, in the Ethereum network. And many Ethereum layer twos require bridges essentially to start bootstrapping those ecosystems. I mean, as we have centralized exchanges start to support this, that's going to become less of a need. But like I was saying before, many users want to be able to move in between different blockchains, okay, without having to go to an exchange first and do everything on chain. So, I mean, what, what does that leave you to do as, as an end user? Like, how can you mitigate this risk? Well, first of all, is to acknowledge that there is risk, all right? We can't necessarily assume this technology is safe. And so for that reason, you know, essentially just not bridging funds over that you can't afford to lose. And that's always my recommendation, even when you're doing anything self-custody in the crypto space, is because, you know, it's not just bridges that are at risk. Like, some people are their own worst enemies in their crypto space. Like, they might, you know, lose access to their funds. Uh, because they, you know, fail to back up their seed phrase for their wallet or their private key, or they even expose their seed phrase, their wallet for their private key. Okay. So definitely anytime you're doing something on chain, just realize you're always at risk when you're, when you're holding your own money. Now, that being said, okay, we've seen a lot of uh, failures in terms of bridges in the recent past. I mean, just this year alone. So what does that mean for the future of the bridges, though? Could we actually see bridge technology become more trustworthy and reliable? Well, I do think this is possible in the future as we start to rely upon cryptography more, okay, to actually make blockchains communicate with one another, if you can see this diagram here, instead of having uh, more central points of failure that rely upon certain optimistic trust assumptions whenever you're actually signing messages and moving funds in between chains. Now, that being said, that's still more of a hope than a guaranteed future. And we'll have to wait to see uh, what type of solutions come out in that vein. And ultimately, they have to be battle tested as well. All right. So that's an overview of these latest bridge hacks in, in the crypto space. The scary truth behind this and what you can do to keep yourself safe. So I hope you like this video. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Daily helps these videos out so that more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step or hey, Maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely. I can show you to master blockchain step by step, start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You'd have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.